Good morning, everyone. Um, this is the presentation I gave at uh, Minds and Money in London in December 2016. And I thought I'd open it with that little musical reminder for those people who had made it all the way through my previous presentation, Nobody Cares, which I gave uh, 12 months ago, almost to the day uh, in 2015, as to just how much things had changed in the subsequent months. Now, I did that purely because, by coincidence, I would be the first to stress the day I gave that presentation, uh, precious metals prices turned around and embarked on an eight-month bull run, which had gold and silver investors emerging from their cellars after four damp, dark, lonely years. But during those eight months, gold bulls were euphoric, and the haters, like Mr. Zweig here, were silent until, eventually, I guess, he could take it no more, and was compelled to explain all over again to intelligent investors just why this ridiculous asset, a ridiculous asset which at that time had risen a little over 30% in eight months, was still nothing more than a pet rock. These fiat bugs are a dogged bunch. Mr. Zweig explained that gold is only really valuable if you lock it away for a couple of thousand years, and that in the short term, it's a disaster. He then went on to highlight just how poorly gold fared in 2008, selecting October of that awful year as his benchmark. And in fairness to Mr. Zweig, though his numbers were a little off by my reckoning, gold did in fact fall just as hard as the S&P 500, some 16%, in October of 2008. However, there may have been an element of cherry picking on Mr. Zweig's part, as pretty much from the day he chose to show that gold was just as bad an investment as equities, gold began to recover, while the S&P 500, well, not so much. Anyway, by March of 2009, gold had actually risen 6%, while the S&P had fallen 42%. Gold did exactly what it was supposed to do. Anyone who sold their gold and invested it into stocks at the March lows has done very well, all thanks to the purchasing power that their gold preserved for them. In his article, however, Mr. Zweig was quite clear that the short term was not gold's sweet spot, and I'd hate to be accused of being disingenuous, so I thought I'd split the difference between my six months and his 2,000 years and look at the performance of gold, stocks, and bonds since the turn of the century, which I think represents a decent enough investment horizon. When I did, guess what I found? Well, as you can see, really not too shabby. Gold, despite virtually halving from its highs, has still doubled the performance of the equity market and has returned four times that of the S&P Total Return Bond Index. Pet rock, my ass. However, after the auspicious start to the year, things started to wobble a little as summer gave way to autumn, and by October, with gold having corrected after its stupendous run, a gentleman by the name of Dan McCrum took his turn a little gold bashing, this time offering us his insight in the FT that bastion of clear-eyed, unbiased financial reporting. The gold price, according to Mr. McCrum, is and will only ever be fashion, and those of us that own it are forever condemned to be merely posers, apparently. Now, in their defense, Zwiggy and McCrum, doesn't that just sound like the worst cop show ever created? Well, they got their timing just about right. Jason Zwig picked the very top of the year to write his piece, bravo, while Dan McCrum's insight came immediately before a $50 rally, but fortunately for him, that turned around pretty fast. Gold has fallen 13% from the peak back in July, and the grave dancers are no doubt high-fiving each other as I speak. Naturally, there's been no mention of the 30% rally which preceded the fall, but then what did we expect? On the day McCrum went to press explaining how gold was nothing but fashion, here's how the scorecard looked year to date. As you can see, not bad. Not bad at all. Anyone so inclined could have actually read McCrum's article and, realising that they were a mere poser, quickly sold out of their precious metals positions, however they chose to hold them, even after the pounding gold had taken and been nicely ahead on the year. In fact, throughout 2016, gold continued to consistently pour into the ETF vaults at an astounding rate, increasing ETF holdings by some 42% between the January low and the October high. Interestingly, despite a sharp sell-off in May, and again in September and October, ETF vaults kept seeing inflows. It wasn't until November that we started to see some of the gold start to be pulled from those vaults, and that was down to one thing. Yeah, that. For those of you still intending to watch the US election when the DVD box set is released, please consider this a massive spoiler alert. Donald Trump will be inaugurated as the 45th President of the United States of America on January the 20th, 2017. 
And in the weeks that followed Trump's election, among the many things he'd been trying to escape, there uh, was a large shadow looming over every single discussion of his upcoming presidency. That shadow took the form of the Gipper himself, Ronald Reagan. But before we attempt to compare the two, we should take a quick look at how the markets reacted to the surprising elevation of Trump from a man believing himself to be the most powerful in the world to it actually being true. On election night, as the results trickled in and it became less of an impossibility that Trump would win, Dow Jones futures crashed hard. They fell almost a thousand points before being halted limit down. The next morning, they rallied 1100 points and the entire round trip took just 15 hours and 15 minutes. When the smoke had cleared, the Dow had fallen 5% and rallied 6.5% on the same news. Now, perhaps unsurprisingly, gold had a similar time of it, rising 5.4% before falling 4.7% in a little over 17 hours. But again, both of these moves were on the exact same news. Folks, any market which can behave in this way is inherently unstable and should be treated as such. However, it's comforting in such confusing times as these that ordinary folks like us can rely on the considered wisdom of a Nobel Prize winner or two to explain things for us. Ah yes, the great Paul Krugman was quick to get into the news cycle and share his wisdom with the little people. And then, as you can see here, he helpfully clarified exactly what he'd meant by a global recession with no end in sight for us a few days later. What would we do without him, I wonder? Seven days after the election, however, things were at least a tiny bit clearer and one could at least start to, sim to assemble a narrative of sorts. Copper was strong on Trump's proposed infrastructure spending. The dollar was strong because rates were going higher. The S&P was up because, well, you know, growth and stuff. Bonds were down because rates were going up and there would be a ton more of them floating around to pay for Trumponomics. And gold was down because of inflation. No, wait, because of the strong dollar. Ugh, gold was down because of course gold was down. But before people like Zwiegen and McCrum write yet another gold obituary, let's take a look at a few of the suppositions baked into the post-Trump euphoria. After that, we can move on to something a little more fun. Now, as I mentioned, the pro-Trump narrative has him as the second coming of Ronald Reagan. But if he isn't, well, let's just say markets have gotten a little ahead of themselves. The comparisons being drawn with Reaganomics are understandable, I guess, except, well, perhaps with the possible exception of this, given Trump's loathing of NAFTA, TPIP, TPP, and as far as I can tell, every acronym except MAGA, hashtag Make America Great Again. But if we look at the pillars of Reaganomics, we see a few familiar ideas. Ideas like reducing government spending, which Trump is all for, or cutting taxes. And who doesn't love Trump's pledge to cut two existing government regulations for each new one enacted? And of course, his plan to raise interest rates to combat... Ooh, OK. So we may have our first little problem. Let's take a look at the economy Reagan inherited and compare it with that which the president-elect will soon be wrestling. <laughs> As you can see from the first chart here, Reagan inherited a CPI which all probability suggested was only going in one direction after the wild oil-led inflation of the 1970s. Meanwhile, 10-year bond yields were in double digits and would peak at 15% before starting the journey to where we find them 36 years later. That's some tailwind. As was the S&P price earnings ratio of seven, which allowed plenty of scope for multiple expansion. The fall after the 22.4 times peak there was largely due to the 87 crash, which, in case any of you have forgotten the time when markets were actually allowed to fall, wiped a quarter of its value off the stock market in a single day. Reagan also inherited a national debt molehill of just $863 billion, something he would start to turn into today's mountain by increasing it to $2.68 trillion during his two terms in office, but again, more tailwinds. And then there was America's debt to GDP ratio, which back in 1980 sat at a very respectable 30% before climbing to 50% under Ronnie Stewardship, 
But even with a setup like that, and having the room to stimulate and expand the nation's borrowing and spending, and with equities as cheap as they'd been since the Great Depression, the S&P still fell by a quarter in Reagan's first two years in office, before turning and beginning what has been an epic 35-year bull market, interrupted only fleetingly by the 87 crash, the bursting of the tech bubble, and all that 2008 stuff. A look at where he started and where he finished shows that Ronnie got his timing just about perfect. Now. Donnie, on the other hand, well, that's likely a different story. Where does he go from here? Well, it remains to be seen, but the euphoria currently on display is a little premature, methinks. We'll see. Now, according to the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, Trump's economic plan, you know, the thing that has people buying equities hand over fist, will decrease government revenues by $5.8 trillion over 10 years. And it will increase the deficit by a further $5.3 trillion over the same period. It will, however, cut spending by $1.2 trillion during that decade, which is nice. However, Trump's plans set the US debt-to-GDP chart on a wholly different trajectory, a trajectory which one would think would perhaps lead to higher rates and crimp the equity markets. But that kind of thinking is passe these days. Everything is going up forever, regardless of silly things like interest rates or, or even economic principles. So at the risk of channeling my inner therapist, what exactly is America's problem, if indeed it does have one? Is it lack of innovation? Well, one look at Silicon Valley would tell you no. Is it a lack of either natural resources or competitive advantage? Surely not. Trade deals? Well, the Donald is going to answer that one for us in time. Is it a lack of any real economic growth? Well, possibly. A strong dollar? That also remains to be seen. But there's one huge problem that America, just like every other G7 country, has to deal with. It's debt, of course. Now, fortunately, it seems as though America has elected the right man for the job, as was made more than evident in an interview Trump gave to CNN's Wolf Blitzer back in May. Yes, the self-proclaimed king of debt loves debt. And if he does love debt, just think how happy he's going to be now that he's responsible for 20 trillion of it overnight, to say nothing of the 100 trillion in entitlement still to come. Happy days. In that same interview, having declared his love of leverage, Trump addressed the problem of rising rates in America, explaining how a 1% increase would be, quote, devastating. In typical Trump fashion, though, he dared to dream a little bigger, imagining an America which saw rates rise 2, 3, or even 4%. His assessment? We don't have a country. But let's take the road less traveled. Let's try and look at a few facts about those various scenarios, and we'll start with this chart of the average interest rate paid on US debt. As you can see, between 2000 and 2016, it's fallen from 6.5% to 2.2%. Interestingly, the only time that average interest rate increased during those 16 years, and we're talking 50 basis points here, not 2, 3 or 4%, 2008 happened. In fact, if we look at the monthly changes in the average debt cost of the United States, we find that in an astounding 77% of the months between 2000 and 2016, they fell. And thank God for that, because due to the credit crisis and the measures enacted to stifle it, the national debt grew from $9.229 trillion at the end of 2007 to $20 trillion on Halloween of this year, a 114% increase in just nine years. But thanks to those falling rates, the cost of servicing those debts increased from $430 billion to $432 billion. Ta-da! Behold magic. The US is currently setting aside just 13% of its tax receipts to pay down its debt servicing costs, which, given that the debt has grown 60-fold since the last time the percentage was that low, is absolutely astounding. Currently, the US is tracking at a little over $2 trillion of tax receipts, and here's where that puts them at the current average interest rate of 2.2%. But what if rates did rise by 1, 2, 3, or even 4%? Would there, as the king of debt suggested, be no country? Well, a 1% rise would hardly be devastating, but with $633 billion needed to pay interest alone, that would put a serious crimp in the budget. A 2% rise, and you're talking serious money, like TARP plus money. That's not good. A 3% rise, and we have a real problem, as over a trillion dollars is required just to pay interest. Now, does any of this look like a reason to dump gold yet, by the way? Just checking. Where was I? Oh, yes, a 4% rise in rates. Well, at 6.2%, I believe the technical term is, you're screwed. Maybe the king of debt was right after all. 
Now, the Trump euphoria is predicated, it seems, upon a massive blitz of infrastructure spending, which will supposedly stimulate the economy and get things moving in the right direction again. Luckily, we have a place to go to see how that idea might play out. Or, for those of you old enough to remember the kids' TV show Rainbow in the UK, we know a song about that, don't we, boys and girls? Yes, of course, Japan, the land of the rising sun, this year instituted its 26th dose of fiscal stimulus since 1990. That's an average of one a year for 26 years. And perhaps unsurprisingly, Goldman Sachs recently published a report which determined that the initial sugar hit of the vast majority of these fiscal injections usually lasted oh, a little less than a month. Coincidence that Shinzo Abe was the first foreign leader to meet the president-elect? Maybe. One of the reasons for Japan's continued failure to get the stimulus right is perhaps the fact that often what the government promises, they don't always deliver on. In each of those 26 cases of fiscal stimulus, the amount of new spending was significantly less than the amount pledged. Broken government promises. Well, I never. Of course, where the Japanese have been successful is in blowing out their debt-to-GDP ratio, which now stands at a world-beating 229%. Interestingly enough, with Trump having been elected and promising Japan-like infrastructure spending, the US is exactly where Japan was 16 years ago and following a worryingly similar trajectory. In short, don't blindly believe the hype about Trumponomics, folks. Be patient and let's see what happens. There's a lot that can go wrong. But that's enough about Japan and Trump. Suffice to say, I don't see his election or his plans being anything close to as bearish for gold as the market reaction would suggest, quite the reverse in fact, but we need to navigate this short-term chop first. As I promised, however, we have far more interesting things to get to today. Things like the dollar and oil, and yes, gold. But also, we're going to visit places like Saudi Arabia and Russia, and of course, you can't have this conversation without roping in China. Now. The rest of this presentation concerns a series of dots that I've been trying to join for some time now, and I recently came across a man in Cleveland, Ohio of all places, who helped join them for me. His name is Luke Grumman, and he writes a piece of research called Forest for the Trees. Now make a note of that. When I'm done, I promise you're going to want to find out more about him, and you're going to have a whole new dynamic to think about in the gold market. The story I'm going to tell begins in the 1970s, when Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon struck a deal with the House of Saud, a deal which gave birth to the petrodollar system. Now, the terms of this deal were very, very simple. The Saudis agreed to only accept US dollars in return for their oil, and that they would reinvest their surplus US dollars into US treasuries. In return, the US would provide arms and a security guarantee to the Saudis, who, it has to be said, were living in a pretty rough neighborhood. As you can see, things went swimmingly. Saudi purchases of treasuries grew along with the oil price, and everybody was happy. Now, we'll come to that blue box on the right shortly. The inverse correlation between the dollar and crude is just about as perfect as one could expect until recently again, but we'll be back to that, as I said. And as you can see here, beginning when Nixon slammed the gold window shut on French fingers and picking up speed once the petrodollar was ensconced, foreign buyers of US debt grew exponentially. Having the world's most vital commodity exclusively priced in US dollars meant everybody needed dollar reserves, and that meant a huge bid for treasuries. It's good to be the king. By 2015, there were treasuries to the value of around six years of total global oil supply in the hands of foreigners, if we assume a constant 97 million barrels per day supply. And seeing as it's my presentation, that's exactly what I've done. Now, with that brief background on the petrodollar system, here's where I need you to stick with me. I promise you it'll be worth the mental effort. You ready? Okay, here we go. I'd like to get in, get on with it, get it over with and get out, get it? Got it, good. Now, back in 2010, then World Bank President Robert Zellick called something of a commotion when he suggested that an entirely new global monetary system maybe wasn't such a bad idea. The system he had in mind involved a freely convertible yuan and, controversially, was constructed around gold as its central reference point. 
In seemingly unrelated news, two years later, Iran began accepting yuan in payment for oil amidst US sanctions. The transactions were conducted, of course, through Russian banks. The crucial part of this deal was that, by diversifying their purchases in this way, the Chinese had found a path towards not only needing to hold fewer US dollar reserves, but to circumventing the petrodollar system altogether. By 2013, the penny had clearly dropped at the PBOC, who declared an end to the era of their accumulation of US treasuries. It was, apparently, no longer in China's interest to accumulate foreign exchange reserves. Sure enough, in 2014, global FX reserves began to decline at the fastest rate in 80 years, as you can see from this chart. That same year, another piece of the puzzle was laid in place, when Zhu Luode, the chairman of the newly founded Shanghai Gold Exchange, explained that gold would be priced and sold in Yuan as a step towards what he called the internationalization of the renminbi. Now, for those of you confused by uh, the words Yuan and renminbi, just think of them as the Chinese equivalent of pound and sterling. Interestingly, Luo Dei acknowledged what he accurately described as the consumption in the East priced in the West problem, and he assured the world that the real price of gold would become apparent once China took its rightful place at the centre of the gold market. We can but hope he's correct. In 2015, another announcement slipped by the world when it was revealed that Russia's Gazprom would also begin selling oil to the Chinese in exchange for yuan, and that they were negotiating further agreements to use rubles and yuan to settle natural gas trading. Okay. Hands up if you're still with me. Okay, great. Now, for those of you who aren't, here's a little recap of where we are so far. Get it? Got it? Good. So here we are in 2016, and as it turned out, April was a hell of a month if you were paying attention. Firstly, the Saudis threatened to sell almost a trillion dollars of US assets, including over 300 billion of treasuries, should a bill be passed by the Congress allowing the Saudis to be held responsible for the 9-11 attacks. Now, in a rare show of bipartisanship, the bill was subsequently passed before being vetoed by President Obama, who then had to watch in ignominy as he suffered the first veto override of his presidency. Just days later, the Saudis were the cause of a seemingly surprise failure by OPEC to agree a production cut as the oil price languished in the low $30 range. Just 48 hours after that surprise, the Chinese finally launched their twice daily gold fixing, setting the price at 256.92 yuan per gram. As Sokjen's Robin Barr correctly identified, if the ability to trade gold for yuan exists within a closed monetary system, its importance will be limited. But as Bloomberg's Ken Hoffman also correctly pointed out, if this was the thin end of the wedge, things could get very interesting indeed. Now, this chart shows the oil price going back to before the US Civil War. And between 1865 and 1973, the price of oil was incredibly stable against the backdrop of perhaps the greatest simultaneous economic, demographic and technological expansion in human history. How was that possible? Well, simply put, because oil was effectively priced in gold. However, once the gold window closed and the petrodollar system was implemented, the price of oil soared 50-fold in just 35 years. This move? Well, we're getting there, I promise. Now, you remember this chart and the huge supply of treasuries which exists compared to oil now. But well, when we add in the roughly $100 trillion in boomer entitlements that will need to be paid for by issuing, you guessed it, more treasuries, the chart changes somewhat. That red circle there is the spike you saw on the previous chart. It's safe to say that relative to even oil and without any infrastructure spending by Donald Trump, treasuries are going to be abundant. Now, conversely, if we look at the value of gold relative to foreign held treasuries, we see an altogether different story unfold. During Reagan's presidency, US Treasuries were backed 132% by the market value of the country's gold reserves. Today, that number has fallen to just 4.7%. If we do the same thing and we account for the 100 trillion in entitlement promises, the number falls to 0.3% in 2025. So, this chart should come as no surprise to anybody. The Chinese have started to do what they promised to start doing when they promised to start doing it. Chinese sales of US Treasuries have been consistent for the last three years, as have their sales of US securities since 2015 after plateauing in 2013 when Treasury divestiture began. Concurrently, 
Chinese sales of corporate bonds have accelerated significantly over the same period. Though it has to be said, agency sales, despite a few periods of fairly consistent selling, have yet to follow suit. But now, as tensions rise and the cross currents get harder to discern, guess who else has showed up as a seller? Yep, that's right. The Saudis are now steady sellers of US Treasuries, and even more aggressive sellers of US securities, as you can see from this chart. Meanwhile, taking a broader view, net foreign purchases of Treasuries, according to the tick data, have been in a clear downtrend since 2009 and have been largely outflows for the last three years. If we take a look at the 12 month sum of sales, we can see an even sharper decline. And if we take the trailing net official demand chart for Treasuries back to 1979, the scale and extent of the change is evident, as are the catalysts for the acceleration. Meanwhile, Russia, who are now selling oil for yuan to the Chinese, remember, have been picking up the pace of their accumulation of gold reserves, with the most recent monthly data setting yet another record. And the pickup in pace is evident here when we look at average monthly purchases prior to 2013 and post the agreements put in place around that time between the various parties. A look at the market value of Russia's gold reserves shows just how things have picked up over the last two years. And that increase in value has cushioned the effects of, amongst other things, the bailing out of the ruble. Now, crucially, the ability to sell oil to the Chinese for yuan and buy gold with that same yuan through the Shanghai exchange has completely changed the game. By August of this year, Russia had overtaken Saudi Arabia as the largest exporter of oil into China, and that wasn't something the Saudis could take lying down. On the contrary, they rededicated their efforts to increase what they call political and strategic support for China. Maybe the key to the whole plan, get it? Got it. Good. Now, I hope you're all still with me because here's where we get to the final piece of this glorious puzzle, the piece that ties all these seemingly unrelated threads together, China's own crude oil futures contract to be priced in yuan and traded at the Shanghai International Energy Exchange, a yuan contract which will be made fully convertible. As you can see from the date, this contract has been postponed several times, ostensibly for reasons such as stock market volatility in China. But perhaps there's more going on behind the scenes that's causing the delay, because once this contract is in place, things change dramatically. In the interim, China has supplanted the US to become the world's biggest importer of oil, which only increases both its importance in the oil markets and the likelihood of it launching its own yuan-denominated contract. So, the world's largest exporter of oil is now dealing with the largest importer directly in yuan, and it has the ability to convert those yuan proceeds into physical gold through the Shanghai Exchange, which the data would suggest it's doing as fast as possible. Currently, the bilateral oil for gold trade is only available to what the US would no doubt consider a basket of deplorables in Iran and Russia. But just think what happens once that fully convertible oil contract is up and running. Suddenly, the availability to price oil and gold is available to everybody, and given rising Saudi-US tensions and the Middle East nation's recent rededication to providing political and strategic support to China, it's easy to see why this would be attractive to the Saudis, for example. Whatever happens, opening that contract creates a market-wide arbitrage opportunity which affords anybody with oil to sell the ability to exchange said oil for gold, and anybody wanting oil to acquire it cheaply by buying cheap gold in the West and shipping it to Shanghai or Hong Kong where it can be sold for yuan. Were this arbitrage to begin happening, with the market for oil far bigger than that for gold, it would immediately be evident in the ratio between the two commodities, which, interestingly enough, is precisely what has happened since the peak of global reserves in 2014 and the Sino-Russian agreement to essentially transact oil for gold. With those conditions in place, the gold oil ratio has broken out to its highest level in 80 years. Which brings us right back to the question mark on this chart, which we looked at earlier in this presentation. The recent move looks rather like a sign that a move has started to return to pricing oil in gold. All of which leaves oil producers with a rather obvious choice. If you're an oil producing country, do you minimize your production in order to maximize your holdings of one of the most abundant and easily produced commodities in the world in the shape of US treasuries? as has been the case for the last 40 years, knowing full well that with the entitlements due, more will be needed to be printed like crazy. Or, 
do you maximize your production in order to gain the largest possible market share in the biggest oil market in the world and through the ability to buy gold for yuan thereby maximize your reserves of a scarce physical commodity which is impossible to produce from thin air and which happens to be not only the most undervalued asset on the planet but is trading at its most undervalued relative to u.s treasuries in living memory with an annual production of 170 billion dollars Gold is by far the largest metals market by value. However, that figure is dwarfed by the oil market, which is 10 times the size of the gold market on an annual production basis. If we throw in the average annual foreign holdings of US Treasuries over the last two years, we see that the other commodity is of a different magnitude altogether. So which one of these commodities has any scarcity value? Given the choice, which one would you seek to maximize your holdings of? Maybe the key to the whole plan, get it? Got it. Good. Gold. Get it? Got it? Good. Thank you very much indeed for listening. I appreciate your time.